Pat Love back with Pat's Two Cents. Here to um, segue into an, a slightly different direction, but almost on the same thing. Um, you guys, be careful who you allow to pray for you and who you allow to lay hands on you while they're praying. Number two, some of you don't need to pray for anybody. You need to keep your hands and your prayers to yourself. Because some of your prayers are killing people. All right. Now I'm going to tell you what I'm talking about. Now a lot of you guys know the thing I went through in the summertime when I was in the hospital four times. When I'd never been in the hospital all my life and all of a sudden, bam, this crisis hit in my body and I had to go in. And they had diagnosed me with congestive heart failure and with AFib and, you know, but my cholesterol, my sugar, all that other stuff was great. So whatever it was, it was a battle with fluids. My body was really hanging on to fluid. Crazy. And the doctor told me four months after he was not sure. I was even going to make it. But I already got a word from God saying that I wasn't going to die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. So I knew I was in. But I knew that the battle, the, the battle had not ended, but the war was already won. You get what I mean? Now, this is what happened during the time I was in the hospital. Had I known I was going to go through this, there is no way I would have allowed this brother to pray for me. But there were two, there were very many visits from the, the two churches I, I, I was attending at the time. And this one brother came, one with one person and one with another member of the church. And he was just, you know, they wanted to see me, so he gave them a ride. Well, they prayed for me. And the thing I noticed was there was one common denominator, him. Do you know each time he left, I battled with the devil all night long. It was demonic attack after demonic attack after demonic attack. My heart was doing all kind of stuff. They were watching me like a hawk. I was already in ICU. But they couldn't figure out why my heart was just going crazy. And then I would, I would when I was sleeping, I was doing all kind of battle with demons coming at me it was the most bizarre thing i had never been under that kind of a demonic siege before well let me share something with you about a year or two ago the brother shared something with me and i should have been careful but i forgot and he said you know i don't know what it's like to be filled with the holy spirit i don't know what it's like to experience god the, his only claim to fame was his denomination and his position in the denomination. That was it. Now, when you have something that's empty, demons are constantly trying to fill that void that should have been filled by the Holy Spirit. Now, he may have been forgiven, swept and garnished, but trust me when I say, when a saint is empty, those demons are fighting to get back in because they consider that their house. They want it back. And they do every. They call all kind of reinforcements to get back in. Now, whether they get in, get kicked out, get in, I don't know because of the prayers of the family members. But I'm telling you, I have never experienced anything like that before. And I said, if I ever get a chance, I'm going to sit down with this man and his wife and tell him and admonish her. Remind him, do not pray for anybody till you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Because I almost died. This is why I'm so adamant, not because of what I went through. I've been adamant about this for years. I'm very adamant about Handling the holy of holies, the things in the holy of holies, the things of God, the, the, the ministry, any of that, God's people. 
You can't afford to handle all that with soiled hands, with dirty hands, with a fouled spirit. You have to be very careful. If you're not sure where you are, don't do anything. Leave it all alone. Just go. And hopefully one day the thing will click in and you and God will have your thing going. But until that day, keep your little uh, willing self to yourself. Because you can end up killing somebody with your good deeds and good intentions. Unknowingly, but it can still happen. Now, this is what I want to say. When a person is ministering, picture this. Picture a water hose, okay? You've got a water hose, and the water is coming from another source. The water hose is not creating its own water. The water is coming from a source. The water is channeled through that water hose until it gets to the desired location. Now, God is the source. His word, His Holy Spirit, his power, his anointing, that's like living water pouring into our souls. Now, you've got a person up in the pulpit, okay? You've got a holy source, and you've got a contaminated channel, a contaminated water hose, so to speak. Who knows if there is animal urine in that hose, if there is animal feces in that hole, if there are dirty insects, if there's dirt in the holes, who knows? And a lot of ignorant, uh, naive, that's what I want to say, a lot of naive saints sit under this feeding. Do you know if I don't feel comfortable about, this, about the channel that, that, that the, the word is coming through, I will get up. I'll go sit outside the church until the preaching is done. I don't believe in allowing dirty hoses to pour into me. I'm not in agreement with that. If, I, if something's wrong in my life, I refuse to mount a pulpit. I won't do it till I can get my act together, get my head screwed on right. I don't play with that. That's a holy that, that's very holy. You don't mess with that and think that you can screw with, with sister so-and-so and, 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 and brother Al's wife and, and sister uh, somebody and, and you're getting these women pregnant and you're doing all you can do, but you got them hush-hush because you're a man of God and whatever you do is holy. And they're I ignorant enough to think when you fill them with a bunch of lies that when you touch them and you feel on them yours is holy hands and God can bless them okay moving right along some of you live a life of a sinner just straight out just call a spade a spade you live a life of a sinner you live a life of sin full of sin, you allow it, you're comfortable with it, you're you, you all in it, hook, line, and sinker. But you step up as a holy vessel of God. You may think you're under an anointing, but God does not bless mess. He will not anoint sin because he will not cohabit with sin. It's either or in his book. Now, if you have an issue with certain characteristics, you know, certain character, uh, the flaws in, in your character, you have certain issues with temper or whatever. Now, God knows what is sin, and he knows what is from being scarred deeply. He's got that kind of sense. We don't. And he will work with you and help you. That's why some church leaders, 
they're great preachers and they may be lousy pastors or they're great pastors and they're not too hot on preaching because there are flaws there there are problems that god is working out but the person is not willfully living in sin the person has shortcomings and issues that are sinful but they're not trying to be that way they're fighting it tooth and nail they're getting the help they're getting prayer they're exposing themselves they're doing everything they can but they are let's say marred or have been marred along the way some some men or some women are are angry they're serving god but they're angry with god for allowing their child to die while they were serving him there there are things that happen in life that knocks the wind out of our sails that's different that's on god i'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole because i know what it's like to be jacked up and scarred mentally emotionally so i know what that's like and i know what it's like to be healed by god and to be understood by god so I'm not dealing with that. What I'm dealing with is a person, they know what they're doing. They keep it hush hush. And they put on their public face for their public that awaits them every week when they come to, to present the Lord before. You know, you, 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 okay. Ooh, thank you, Lord. That's a perfect example. Wow. <laughs> it's like a chef cooking in a high-class restaurant. Everything looks beautiful. The chandeliers, the lighting, the ambiance, the furniture, the flooring. I mean, whoever designed it, I mean, they went all out. Places, swank. But the chef is in the back. And there are roaches everywhere. Rats. All kind of vermin going on. And he doesn't really wash the pots. He's in a hurry trying to make all these bucks. So he's rinsing and, you know, he might drop a piece of meat on the floor, pick it up, run some water on it, plop it in the pan, and hey, it's on and cracking. And people are eating and thinking, oh, <laughs> pristine. Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. And they don't realize they're eating contaminated food. Or he mixes some old food from last week that's about to spoil or already starting to spoil. But he doesn't want to throw it away. He, want to, he wants to make money. The more, the merrier. The more food, the more money. So he mixes it in with fresh stuff. And some people, you know, they got strong constitutions, so they may not get sick. They may have a little something, something going, maybe a little extra gas or a little something, but he slides by. And people don't know. Or somebody he doesn't like or one of his staff members don't like. And while they're getting ready to deliver the food to the table of the people they don't like, yeah, they add a little something nasty in there. So they can chuckle while the person's eating away. That is what it's like to receive the word of God, the holy food, the manna from heaven, through a contaminated vessel. You get me? Yeah, I thought you'd see it when I use food. That's why I'm very careful who I, I listen to when it comes to preaching. I'm not going to let, excuse me, anybody serve me my meal when I'm not sure if they're even clean enough to do so. <laughs> 